Hello, I'm Cheryl Peralt, and welcome to Common Ground Storytelling. This is our first of a monthly program featuring true storytelling from people of our community near and far. Tonight's theme is getting to know you, which involves first time encounters with strangers or animals or other strange beings. I have hosted true storytelling for a number of years on the idea of the moth uh, storytelling hour. Um, this is the first time that I have hosted storytelling on Zoom. And this is hosted through HCAM TV cable and YouTube live streams. So this is a unique experience. And I would like to thank Jim Cousins in particular for all of his work in helping to make this program happen in a slightly different way, since we can't be together at, say, Bittersweet Cafe or other places of storytelling that I have been. Admittedly, we can't still get together in public places with the pandemic going on. We've been through a lot as a country and as a community. So this is a good time for sharing our stories together. I would like to start our program with a poem to give as an introduction. It's titled Gate A4 by Naomi Shihab Nye. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight had been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor wailing. Help, said the flight agent, talk to her. What's her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. Shudawa, shubiduk, habiti, stani shwe, min fadlik, shubit away. The minute she heard any words she knew, however portly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, we're fine. You'll get there. Just later. Who is picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane and ride next to her. She talked to him, and then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. Then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had ten shared friends. Then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up to two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling of her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamu cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag, and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free apple juice from huge coolers and two little girls from our flight ran around serving it and they were covered with powdered sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country tradition. Always carry a plant. Always stay rooted to somewhere. 
And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. This poem I felt set a, an important precedent for this idea for a storytelling program. This share world we have through storytelling is what the intention is to provide by making time to sit and listen and understand and connect with one another. And we are here tonight to, for this experience of having a common ground of our words that can be our connecting force in this world. So we're about to get started and we have 10 community storytellers to introduce to you. We have eight of them in the house, which is really in their house, uh, but they're in the Zoom gallery tonight. And I'll tell you a little bit about the expectations of what these storytellers were asked to do. They were gathered uh, with people I came in contact with, have seen recently, and I asked if they could consider please recording a true story of five minutes, no more, and that the true story address our topic of strange encounters. And I let the folks know, some of them who have not even ever told a true story before, there are a thousand ways to tell a true story. There is no right or wrong. And there are a thousand ways to listen to a story, meaning um, that we don't use judgment. We use who we are as a listener and we uh, listen to the person telling their unique story. And we invite judgment to go right out the door. That's how storytelling works with me. So there's no judgment of oneself while they're telling the story, no critical mind giving a review of oneself, and there's no judgment of one another. Uh, the expectation, no harm to anyone. We won't be able to clap for each other tonight. That's often a really fun and spirited part of sharing our stories together, but we will be in the gallery together. There are eight folks there and we can, um, they'll be cheering each other on and we can cheer from home where we are too. And I will thank each one on behalf of their contribution. With that, with that said, let's get started. I've told you the theme, getting to know you with strange encounters. And I will briefly introduce you to our storytellers that we have before we show their uh, recorded story. And we'll take a minute to talk with each one of them. And I'm really looking forward to the night. And so get yourself comfortable and get prepared to listen to some wonderful stories from our community. We're going to start with Jan Krauss Green and show her story as well, but she could not be here tonight. Jan Krauss Green is the author of two books. She used to live in Holliston and teach in the Hopkinton Public Schools back in the 70s. She has been to HCAM Studios for a number of ev events. Jen was planning to be with us tonight, but cannot be here because she has a loved one in the hospital dealing with COVID at this time. And I told her that I would put a call to send out well wishes and prayers for her loved one. And likewise to any of you with loved ones and family and friends dealing with COVID or other serious illness. So um, we are thinking of Jan and we'll take a look at her story now. Hi, I'm Jan Krause Green and I have a little story to tell you about the first time I met Senator Robert F. Kennedy. I was in high school living outside of Washington, D.C., and I read a book that he had written and did a book report on it for a high school class, and I was very impressed with the book. And 
having a rather high opinion of myself, I was also rather impressed with the book report. So I thought, of course, he would want to read it. So I sent it off to him with a letter saying how inspired I was by what he wrote and how much I wanted to contribute to society and asking him what could a teenage girl do um, to be a good citizen but also to make some kind of a contribution. And time went by and one day a letter in a large envelope arrived from his Senate office and my heart was beating like crazy when I opened it. And there was this really nice letter from him saying that he was touched that I took his book so seriously and was inspired by it. And also that um, he was returning my book report as I requested and he invited me to come to his Senate office building and work as a volunteer on weekends if I wanted to. So of course I wanted to and the very next Saturday my mother drove me down to Capitol Hill and dropped me off and I made my way into his office. Uh, the only people there at the time were some aides, but they all, uh, you know, they kind of knew that maybe I was coming and they said, now that I was there, I could answer the phone. They'd only be gone for about 15 minutes and that they didn't think anybody would call or come in, but they were gonna go take a coffee break. And so I was there by myself and almost as soon as they left, a Boy Scout troop arrived and asked for a tour. And I probably should have said, oh, you know, I can't really give you a tour. But instead, I thought, well, what the heck? So I walked them around the office and pointed out memorabilia, things that they could have seen, certainly without my help, and told them little anecdotes that I knew about the Kennedy family from things I'd seen on the news or read in magazines. And they seemed satisfied, they left, and then I was there alone. Not too long after that, the phone rang and I answered Senator Kennedy's office. And he said, or a voice on the other end said, are there any messages for me? And I said, well, how should I know if you don't tell me your name? At which point he said, well, I'm the Senator. Who's this? And I said, oh, I'm Jan Geis, the girl who wrote the book report, and you told me I could come to the office. And he started laughing, and he said, are you going to be there for a while? And I said, oh, yes, I'll be here till 3 o'clock when my mother comes to pick me up. And he said, well, I'm going to come meet you in person. So shortly thereafter, the aides arrived, and they had me opening mail. And then he arrived, and he saw me, and he kind of, he kind of pointed to me, and he said, are you Jan Geist? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I want to introduce to my staff. And he came over and he put his arm around me and he said, I want to introduce to my staff the woman or the young girl who put me in my place, but good. And he was laughing and they looked a little surprised, but he seemed to get a good laugh out of it. And he invited me to come down to the cafeteria with him. He bought me lunch and we sat and talked, and I ended up going there every Saturday for almost two years, and both summers, junior year and senior year in high school. And during that time, we became good friends. He invited me to his home, and I went to cookout with the family. I went swimming in their pool, and it was really such an exciting thing for me, and he was such an influence. And of course, I was very devastated a couple years later when he was killed. But I did learn something about myself too, that perhaps I was a little too, uh, too much of a wise guy and I should be more careful about what I say to people, especially when I'm answering the phone. Anyway, that's my story. Yes, and thank you for your story, Jan, and well wishes to your family member so that's our first story and that's how it goes and I would like to now introduce our storyteller number two and that's Dina Tavares hi Dina hello Dina's coming here from Dedham and Dina is a visual artist a poet a performing artist and she's shared her poetry her stories and her songs in the Boston area as well as a number of programs in Hopkinton and at HCAM TV so, Dina, 
how have you been doing in these times of the pandemic and quarantine, the still quarantine we're experiencing? Um, yeah, I think I'm experiencing what a lot of people are experiencing, missing all my friends and um, sort of close connections in that sense. Um, but I've been pretty much painting my way through the pandemic. Um, painting, writing, um, anything creative that I can keep myself busy, but um, staying connected as well, trying to stay grounded in that sense. Um, I've been doing a lot of FaceTime and Zoom tea times with friends, which I decided one day, you know, I like the platform where we gather as groups, but I was really missing the one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I schedule every week at least once, <laughs> once or twice in my calendar, FaceTime or Zoom tea times and just have a cup of tea and a conversation. Um, so that's been really great for me um, just to stay connected. Um, so. We're so glad that you could connect into Zoom and be a part of this storytelling event tonight. So, ready? Thank you for having me. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you for being a part of it. And let's take a look at your story. Hi, my name is Dina. And I want to start by saying, have you ever had a serendipitous moment? Um, I have had many. However, there's one in particular that I would like to share with you now. But before I continue, you need to know something about me. Um, I was born with a central nervous system disorder. I have a rare disease. It's spina bifida, and I also have tethered cord syndrome. And the what I live with every day is a deep ingrained knowledge of my disease. Um, the various possible outcomes and the heaviness of the word progressive, which this condition is progressive. Um, and I've never met anyone like myself before, nor has it been encouraged. However, one day in particular, I was in the town of Maynard for a parade for a friend's artwork that was returning home after a great deal of attention focused on this work. Um, many artists came together and gathered on a beautiful fall day, it was bright blue skies, and we gathered in a parking lot um, and very festive. People were dressed colorfully, colorfully dressed and in costumes and everything in celebration of this artwork. And I saw a group of women in the parking lot having a conversation nearby. And we began chatting together about the Prouty Garden, which was a hospital garden that was in the news. And one of the women said, I can't believe it's been four years since my back surgery. And when she mentioned that, it sparked my attention, my interest, uh, because she looked to be about my age and I just wondered, like, imagine if we had similar um, conditions. Um, so that just sat in the back of my mind. We proceeded with the parade. There was music, it was lively. We walked down to the gallery in the center of town and um, there were children outside drawing chalk outside of the gallery. And I stepped inside and began making my way through, looking at all of the artwork. And I found this woman in the center. Um, she was a hat maker. She had all these whimsical, beautiful hats with lots of my favorite tertiary colors. <laughs> um, and she said to me, would you like to try on a hat? I said, yes, I would love to try on a hat. So I put on a hat, picked out a hat. We took a selfie immediately. And uh, I think we hit it off right away. I said, hello, my name's Dina. She said, hello, I'm Denise. And we struck up a conversation um, well, all the while that her other story was in the back of my mind. Um, and there was just a familiarity about her and an openness to her. And I just had this instinctive, you know, about her that we were kindred spirits, that there was more to our story. So upon leaving the gallery, returning home, I immediately and fearlessly <laughs> sent her a message uh, online and I said, hey, Denise, it was so lovely meeting you at the event. Um, I, besides, 
you know, having art in common, I believe that we may have a little bit more in common as I have already had. I have also had multiple back surgeries. And as a matter of fact, I have spina bifida and tethered cord syndrome. And she, I waited, I dropped that, waited, and it seemed like an eternity, really an eternity, but it was probably about a minute. <laughs> so she chimed back with, wow. And I thought, wow, 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 what does this wow mean? Like the audacity of this woman, or wow, we do have more in common. Um, what did this wow mean? Um, she then followed up with, besides just having art in common, we both have spina bifida and tethered cord syndrome. And my mouth dropped to the floor. In that moment, I instantaneously felt less alone in the world. And we hit it off. And our first meeting was at Serendipity Cafe. And we call ourselves spy Team Spina Bifida and we are back buddies for life. And I'm so grateful to have you, Denise, in my life. And we're gonna get through this together. Back buddies for life. Thank you so much, Dina. I see the cheers in the gallery and uh, that's a really powerful story uh, of uh, your encounter with friend. We're moving on now to Bob Snyder, uh, story number three. And Bob uh, lives in Hopkinton. He's retired. He used to work as an engineer at EMC. He's well known in town as he has been heavily involved in town organizations and community service. I'm told people know Bob's name wherever you go. And he has been known to share a story or two at the Main Street Cafe um, and the Mothra. So welcome, Bob. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Well, hi, Cheryl, and thanks for having me. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to this new storytelling opportunity that we're all going to have through you. Yes, um, you uh, I indeed have been a Hopkinton resident for a long time now, and my wife Sally behind me here and I are, are uh, full-fledged uh, Hopkinton seniors. Um, and my, these are two uh, strong acts to follow, but um, I have no choice and the story is already on on the tape, so I will do that. Um, my story is no about- No judgment, right? <laughs> right, no judgment. Um, my story is about uh, an, an experience that we probably have all had at some time, which is the first day on a new job and uh, sort of uh, combined with the first interview on the new job, both happened on this occasion, um, which you'll hear about. And it has led um, to uh, a very strong friendship um, and a very long time friendship over 50 years and a inter-family friendship eventually. However, at the time I didn't even have a family or a wife and a family. So um, that's the um, that's background. All right. Well, let's take a look and see what happens. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. I'm Bob Snyder, and this is the story of Bob Snyder meets John Henderson. It's 1969, and I, Bob Snyder, am starting a new job at a new company in a new um, geography, which is uh, uh, Massachusetts, Southboro, Massachusetts Data General Corporation. Um, I moved there from uh, Washington, D.C. And I'm taken to my new office. Um, and in that office is my office mate, Mr. John Henderson. We spend the morning getting ourselves acquainted with one another. Uh, and he, since he'll be my manager and supervisor, um, uh, needs to find out 
all that he can about me. Um, and I need to be a good um, interviewee for him uh, because, after all, it's my new job. Um, so what follows that morning is this um, long conversation uh, with him doing a fair amount of screening and um, each of us uh, getting better acquainted. I immediately sense that I'm really going to like this guy. And he, at the same time, seems to be a little um, anxious and uptight. And with each exchange that we have, I become increasingly convinced that I really like him. And he seems to get more anxious with each exchange. That is how the morning would proceed with those both of those trends continuing the more uh, he the more he looked uh, anxious and uh, maybe even untrustful of me um, the more I knew I liked this guy um, and I had plenty of reason myself to be anxious since it was my first day on a brand new job but I just liked him and meanwhile, he seemed to uh, continue to um, act more, not distressed, but just not comfortable. Um, so, eventually that morning came to an end. We went out and had lunch. We returned. We went on about the daily duties of that day that were very similar to the duties that we would both be carrying on for many days to follow at Data General. In my case, eight more years. Um, that's the end of the story, uh, except the question is, why were each one of us in the apparent frame of mind that we were? Well, there was a reason. Uh, it turned out that I was part of a package deal um, coming to Data General that that day and the other part of the package also started that day and he was my colleague at my former employer in uh, Washington DC area and he uh, arrived to be assigned to John's old solo office and John at the same time was dispatched to a joint office that he would be sharing with me so he was that day doing a very slow burn about that um, and I, at the same time, I think was absolutely relieved to know that I was out of the shadow of my uh, colleague uh, from um, from the previous employer in the Washington area. Um, I would add that John and I uh, are very, very close friends. It's now over 50 years later. Um, we have all kinds of common interests. Uh, and to this day, we still um, are frequently in touch with one another. And it's been a very happy ending, but um, it's got off to a stilted start back there in 1969. Well, thank you, Bob. And I hope that John's watching this and hearing this great story. We've heard about friendship, uh, kindred spirit, long-term friendship, and uh, meeting with Senator Kennedy um, in his office. And now we're going to uh, meander over to talk with Denise Antaki uh, and talk to her about her uh, encounter with a stranger, which uh, isn't far from home, as I recall. And Denise is a Hopkinton resident who works in retail, who's very helpful and conversational uh, with all people in town and apparently the tiniest of creatures. Hello, Denise. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> Thanks uh, for having me. Yes, I'm so glad that you could come and share a story. And I'm wondering if you could tell the audience a little something about your story before we show it. Yes, as I... As I was uh, re-watching, I, I uh, realized I didn't really explain everything. I mean, as it, as it uh, pertains to getting to know you. But um, 
I think I found that while I was able to bond with this tiny creature, this tiny creature was less apt to bond with me. Um, this, this creature simply doesn't have the capacity to become friends. So, um, but nonetheless, uh, the benefits of connecting with nature um, can have a significant impact on our health and well-being, especially during these pandemic times. So um, I think that's why I thought of um, to do this story. Yes. Um, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, showing up, being up close uh, in these times of quarantine with our uh, new friends. And yes. Here we go. Let's take a look. Thank you, Denise. Hi, my name is Denise. Now, while I've had uh, many interesting and memorable encounters with people over my lifetime, I'm going to tell you a little story about a creature, uh, specifically a spider that moved into my house last May. Uh, I found it very fascinating. First of all, it, I found it right here under my kitchen sink. Uh, sorry, under my windowsill over my kitchen sink. And it was there for a while. Um, it didn't look like it uh, had caught anything in its web. And, and and it really started looking anemic. If a spider can look anemic. It was kind of pale. So I thought, gee, maybe I should try to feed the spider or something. Uh, even though I have fruit on the counter, there weren't, it wasn't, they weren't really producing fruit flies or something that could get caught in the spider web. So I went outside and dug up a lawn grub and I threw it into the web. The lawn grub was a little too heavy and it fell down to the kitchen counter. So I ended up sticking on a toothpick and taping it under the windowsill there. And eventually I think the spider did um, eat it. So about a month later, and it was still there. I think it was the same spider. I couldn't really tell. And I uh, I, I uh, went out and um, killed two ants and uh, well, kind of immobilized two ants from outside. And I brought them in and I threw them into the web. And uh, when the spider felt something in its web, it, it immediately ran over to the ants. And that was fascinating to watch. So it proceeded to wrap uh, or spin a web and wrap up the spider, uh, sp wrap up the ants in its web uh, like little sacks. And uh, it did it to both the ants. So it was fascinating to watch um, two of the spider's legs uh, wrapping the web, which I couldn't see coming out of its body, but... Uh, I think it was because I eventually saw this ant, the insect, uh, becoming wrapped up in, in webbing. So um, I don't know how long a single black ant will feed a spider. But eventually I found these little sacks of, um, I guess, carcasses down on my countertop under the windowsill under the web, and I think those were the cast-off remnants that the spider uh, threw out of its web. So that uh, was fascinating. And then eventually, I, I guess I didn't name the spider because I didn't know if it was a male or a female. And um, I would see it every day and because uh, I'm always at the kitchen sink each day. And I thought it was... Uh, kind of neat to see this creature. I don't know if it was waiting for more food or what. Um, and so over about a span of a month, I, you know, kept uh, throwing bugs into the web. And then one day um, it was gone. So I looked around to see if it took residence anywhere else uh, in my kitchen, but I couldn't find it. So I thought that that was the end of it. And there was no egg sack left. Uh, you know, for uh, new babies. And um, maybe I'll get another uh, spider uh, this coming May, hopefully, and I can also feed it again. But I was glad to have kept it alive for um, a while. 
Uh, I hope you enjoyed my story. Uh, and maybe I'll have another one this coming summer. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I see the clapping in the gallery. <laughs> Thank you, Denise, for really um, going up close and sharing a story of friendship with uh, the spider in your home and um, sharing your heart, as well as a little bit of science for us to learn more about uh, spiders as well that are coexisting with us. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now we're moving on uh, to hear a story from Shazan Khan. And Shazan is a Hopkinton resident, and he's currently away at college studying neuroscience. And he serves on a number of committees in town, including the Hopkinton Freedom Team. And uh, Shazan, I'd like to say hello. Thank you for joining us in the midst of your studies. And uh, I am wondering if you could tell us what have you been doing involved with during this time where we're still dealing with pandemic and some level of quarantine? Hi, Cheryl. Thank you for having me here. So, um, I mean, quarantine and the pandemic has really been a set of wild cards for me with regards to the various activities that I'm doing for fun. I mean, Netflix is always an option so many good shows and they've added quite a few new ones recently um, and I practice calligraphy in my sitar um, whenever I get the opportunity um, but when it comes to the various committees that you uh, alluded to um, Hopkins and Freedom Team obviously is one of the ones that I'm participating in is one of my favorite ones um, because it centers around important work regarding racial and social justice um, but also there's another uh, group that I'm co-facilitating co with um, with an intern from Hopkins Youth and Family Services called Just Youth, which is a very similar goal to Hopkins and Freedom Team, but more centered around the youth experience in high school. So yeah, just a couple of things here and there. Sounds like you're pretty busy amidst your studies as well. Um, so thank you. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, have you been sharing stories before? I'm not the type of person that will go to like a, an event to form, formally share stories. I've shared like stories of experiencing discrimination in the school systems before. Um, when we had that event two years ago, I think I was a junior then in the high school, but I just like talking in general. So whenever <laughs> someone's there to listen to my various tales, I will regale. I could tell you are natural hearing your talking. So thank you for our story on this program today. Let's take a look and see uh, the story that Shazan has shared with us. So hello everyone, I'm Shazan Khan. I just graduated from Hopkinton High School. Um, you can see my hair is quite oily right now because I have some coconut oil sitting in there. Um, I, I'm 18, obviously, because I graduated. And I currently study at Brown University. Um, today I will be telling you the story of when I met this cow. It was an interesting cow. I was in Pakistan at the time. It was probably three or four years ago in the city of Faisalabad. Um, and I was at this farm with my family choosing uh, animals for slaughter. Now that might sound very archaic, however, there, it is a tradition in the Islamic religion to sacrifice an animal on the festival known as Eid al-Adha, and that festival was quickly approaching us. So we had to choose animals quick so to slaughter and then to spread out and distribute the meat for charity. Anyway, that's some background. So I met this interesting little cow it wasn't a little cow, it was actually a big cow, and I actually, I don't remember whether it was a cow or a bull, but it was a bovine of some sort, um, and it was docile at first. Um, I remember standing in front of its pen, and mind you, there was no fence or no gate to this pen. The only thing holding it back was a rope um, that it was tied to, and it was inside its little pen. My cousin... Um, decided it was a good idea to just charge 
at the charge at the bull. Like my cousin charging at the bull. Just, you know, give him a little, um, a bit of a run for its money. Not that it really has any. Um, and so my cousin, you know, startled the bull. And I was just sitting, standing there, you know, minding my own business and not doing anything wrong. Uh, and the bull sees me instead of my cousin and it gets angry. Now, I don't see that it gets angry until the last moment where it starts to, you know, rile up and then it charges quickly. But as I didn't know that it was still tied to its little rope. So I jumped back because I get startled really easily. So I jumped back real like suddenly and I landed on one foot. Now, I did not know what was going to be under that one foot. I landed on my left foot and landed right in to a very slippery puddle of brown muck. Now, I don't know, and I hope it wasn't manure, but it was brown. It was probably mud. And I just slipped right back, slipped right back into the mud. And I was covered in the stuff. I was covered in mud. And everyone just looked at me and just looked at me in utter and complete disappointment to see how the American kid, the... um. The overseas American came into this country and just slipped on some muck in front of this random cow. It's looking at me in that sort of disappointment. And so the, one of the people over there at the farm had to wash me with the hose and wash my clothes with the hose so to get the muck off. And so that's the story of when I met this interesting little big cow or bull or whatever bovine creature it was. Um, and how it scared me into a puddle of mud and got me dirty. I hope you enjoyed. All right. And there's clapping in the gallery. And thank you, Shazan, for sharing that story of adventure. Uh, we had uh, the extremes of a little tiny uh, spider in a house to meeting the encounter with a bull outside. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Well, um, we're moving along now. Uh, and we have another story coming from a Hopkinton resident. And I'd like to introduce you to Lynn Canty. And Lynn is here with us. Um, there you are. And Lynn, I'll just tell you about it. Uh, Lynn works with young people in the Hopkinton Public Schools and works uh, for young people on the Hopkinton Youth Commission and is on the Hopkinton Freedom Team as well. Hi, Lynn. And hi, good to have you here and Thanks. tell a story. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could, you would like to tell a little introduction about your story before we show it today. Okay, so my story has to do with um, the time I ran my first marathon. Um, I'm not really a runner, so it was kind of a big deal, but I started getting into it after I had my daughter. Um, so it's, it's a story I really, that it, it's a very bittersweet story for many reasons, but more sweet than bitter um, in that it reminds me that there's such good in humanity. And sometimes you don't even have to look to find it. It just finds you. And when I reflect on that story, I just, it just makes me feel good. So. Well, uh, that I'm looking forward to hearing it and uh, we will get the camera rolling. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Lynn. I've been looking forward to this. Some time ago, after having baby number three, I decided I wanted to run, get fit, lose the baby weight, and just have something to do that was good for my health. So I joined a running club. I went from a run walk to training for a 5K and eventually I built up to running half marathons. Shortly after that, we moved to Hopkinton. It was the summer of 2015. And the only two things I knew about Hopkinton were one, it had a great school system and two, it's where the Boston Marathon started. So when that spring rolled around and it was time for the Boston Marathon, I did what, what most families here do and packed up my family and we went to watch the start of the marathon. I was not prepared for what came next. I was immediately and completely enthralled and just downright sucked in. 
And I was convinced that running a marathon is something I had to add to my bucket list. And so I did. I signed up with the Hopkinton Running Club, made some really good friends. Um, the first marathon I signed up to run was with Team Just Because, raising money for the Semper Fi Fund. And it was the Marine Corps Marathon back in 2016. It was quite an experience. Um, I did the work, I trained, I was ready, and the day came around, I was pumped. I had all this positive self-talk, I got this, this example I'm setting for my kids is amazing. Whoever thought I would be running a marathon, Oprah did it, of course I can do it, all kinds of stuff, it was great. The race began and everything was great until it wasn't. Um, which was around miles 16 to 18. Things began to break down. I tried to dig deep. I tried to turn it around, but the mental and physical anguish I felt was unprecedented and unparalleled. I gave up. I threw my hat in the ring. I was done. I quit. Right after mile 18, I got out of the race, sat on the curb, and pulled out my phone to call my husband. I was done. And there was nothing that I thought could convince me to finish that race. Things were cramping that I never even know, knew could cramp. It was something else. So as I sat there um, waiting for my husband to pick up, and ultimately he didn't, I started contemplating my next moves. Do I just keep calling until he picks up? What do I do? Um, and I look up and one of the runners, an older lady, she had to have been 10 or more years older than me, beckoned to me. She said, come on, come on, sis, we've got this. And I was like, oh no, 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 I'm done. I'm, I'm all done. Um, but she didn't give up. She just insisted, she persisted and Whatever, I don't know what it was about her, but there was something about her. I don't know if it was that she was older than me and just she had this aura about her that was so calm. And I'm like, there's, I mean, we're in mile 18. You don't even look like you've broken a sweat. But ultimately she convinced me to get back in the race and I did. So I got back in the race. We ran together for maybe just over a mile. In that time I learned her name was Beverly and she was from Virginia. And she, um, this was not her first marathon. Um, she just encouraged me at some point, we were separated from each other, but something in my brain had flipped and I was then determined to finish. And I was just so grateful and I still am for the course angel I met that day because Beverly, Beverly from Virginia was my course angel. So I finished my first marathon, the Marine Corps Marathon, all 26.2 miles of it. And I was very happy I did. I learned a very valuable lesson in a lot of things, in persistence, in being the light for someone else, that's probably my, my biggest takeaway is she was a light for me. And that is just invaluable. To this day, I tell this story because I, I've run two other marathons since that one. And if I hadn't finished that first one, I would never have run another marathon again. So that's my story. Thank you, Lynn. And you, uh, congratulations to you on the achievement of your marathons and, and for inspiring us. Um, perhaps we'll, you'll get a few of us out there on the marathon as well. Thank you so much for that story. And so we, we have uh, gone on quite a few adventures already uh, in addressing this theme this evening. Um, and uh, in terms of um, different places uh, we have uh, moved around to and different encounters with beings and people as well. And next we are meeting with Mina Barath, who is a Hopkinton resident. 
Nina has worked in finance and she is chair of the Gifted and Talented Education Advisory Council and commissioner on the Asian American Commission of Massachusetts. And I once interviewed Mina also for Meet Your Neighbor, and she was trying to teach me how to blow and make a great mighty sound with a conch shell, which I did not achieve, but she does very well, among other things. And Mina, hi. Hello, Cheryl. Here. Uh, I wonder if you could just tell us a little about yourself, what you've been doing. How are you doing in this time of uh, this new year and still dealing with pandemic and quarantine. Uh, thank you for having me, Cheryl. It's so lovely to be with you and all these wonderful panelists and uh, listening to their stories. Um, for me, the past year, past 10, 11 months have been a time of reflection, um, a time where I have purposefully tried to witness what we are going through as a humanity. Um, and just learning about myself. It's also been a time of self-care. And as uh, our friend Shazen was saying, uh, it is also time of Netflix. Uh, so I have done all of that. Uh, but one other thing that I want to share with you is I've also been taking a lot of online courses um, and uh, reading quite a bit. And one course that I'm taking on Coursera is about the science of well-being. And in that, I learned about savoring, savoring every moment, savoring the things that I'm doing, savoring my time spent in nature, and savoring this time with all of you. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, and that is good to hear some suggestions for spending this time in savoring and now we can sit back and we can savor the film that you made for us on this particular theme. So let's take a look at uh, Mina's pre-recorded story. I grew up in New Delhi, India. Uh, my father used to work at the Parliament House and uh, we actually used to live very close to that area. And the three of us grew up, my, my brother, my sister, myself, and, uh, you know, we were a nuclear family. Uh, my parents had actually moved from southern India uh, to New Delhi in the 1960s. And in those days, there was a stark difference culturally as well as linguistically between the southern and northern regions of India. And um, we did not have any extended family in New Delhi. So my parents, I guess, used to long for their family. Uh, and uh, my mother especially, I guess, raising three kids is not easy. And uh, she used to wait for the summer holidays to be able to get a break from the daily grind and the rigmarole of raising three kids and uh, taking care of her family. And so she would plan months ahead of time to travel um, the distance uh, was about 1,500 or 2,000 kilometers between where we were and uh, where my mama lived. Uh, and so my mother would buy all these gifts for all her sisters and my grandparents and her cousins and this guy who used to work at the goldsmith shop. Uh, so our bags, needless to say, were heavy. And uh, so this happened during one of those journeys. This must have happened when I was about 10 years old. We were ready with our bags and we reached New Delhi Railway Station, uh, perhaps an uh, hour and a half ahead of schedule as is the norm in our household. I remember the train pulling into the platform and us trying to figure out our uh, coach, which was a two-tier coach. Uh, we got in and located where we were going to be our cabin and uh, we figured out and secured our bags and we're just trying to orient ourselves. That's when, uh, you know, other passengers started coming in. So uh, first came a uh, lady, a young mother with an infant, and she was going to be traveling with us. Um, and, and soon after, there came a man. Uh, he was tall, dark, and he had a mustache, a thick mustache. I don't know what was it about him that made me a little stiff and cautious. Um, but that was, uh, you know, those were our co-passengers and uh, so started our journey. As the journey began, um, you know, I started observing this person quite keenly. 
he was uh, very kind to my mother. He offered her his birth, his lower birth. Also, as the train traveled and stopped at various stations, uh, he got down and got his water. Um, he offered the snacks he was carrying, generally being friendly. I, of course, wasn't uh, participating in that. And then soon after, he uh, started engaging the kids and he started telling some stories and asking puzzles. Now, my guard must have been coming down a little bit. Also, it's hard to resist puzzles. So I got involved and uh, I loved the puzzles. And I remember having a wonderful time. And soon I was laughing and had a great time. As it turns out, he was a scientist uh, and he was going to where he was deputed and uh, his name is Gangadhar. Uh, as the night progressed, there was music and singing and the young mother was a great Carnatic singer. My sister, who has a fabulous voice, she sang. So there was a lot of uh, fun overall. Before long, uh, we were at Vijayawada train station and uh, we all exchanged addresses. And uh, as we got down, Gangadhar Bhaiya helped us with our bags. And as we waved goodbye, I remember feeling, I wish this journey had lasted a little longer. Now we remained friends for a very long time. We used to write letters. Uh, last I know, Gangadhar Bhaiya was living in Bangalore. Maybe in one of these journeys that I go to, where my son gets to meet his amma, maybe we will stop at Bangalore and uh, meet Gangadhar Bhaiya and maybe solve more puzzles. Here is a puzzle that Gangadhar Bhaiya gave me. See if you can solve it. There are nine coins. One of the coins is heavier than the other eight. You have access to a regular balance beam, balance scale, and you may use it twice. And by using it twice, you have to find out the coin which is fake. Can you do that? Good luck. Mina, and we have applause in the gallery again. Uh, and that sounds like quite a memorable uh, train ride and person. And I notice a lot of uh, themes of kindness uh, coming out of these stories with encounters with the strangers, maybe not so much with the bull. But uh, anyway, we're moving on. And I see that uh, we have uh, two, three more stories to go. So we are running a little behind, probably um, from our eight o'clock time. Um, and this is an experiment and uh, I'm delighted that we had 10 tellers and maybe uh, that was because I was talking too much at the beginning, but we're going to move on. And I am delighted to introduce to you uh, next, Bob Foster. And Bob uh, is a resident of Hopkinton. Hello, Bob who uh, I recently had the pleasure of interviewing for Meet Your Neighbor. And Bob is retired. He used to work as an engineer and he still does some teaching. And he is the author of one book and another is on the way. And um, when I recently uh, introduced Bob and Meet Your Neighbor, he uh, said that he is 88 years and I would add young and says the secret to staying young is connection and uh, emphasize that in different ways. And uh, Bob, uh, we have your story here today about meeting a stranger for the first time. I wonder if you uh, wanted to share a few words about the story as an introduction. Well, uh, sure. Uh, Cheryl, uh, your story about uh, the um, Arabic speaking lady uh, in Albuquerque in an airport, just confirmed um, thoughts that I've had about travel. I've done a lot of traveling in my years of experience, uh, of my years of uh, retirement. And I usually get overseas, you know, into Europe or someplace at least once a year. So I've done quite a bit. But what I've noticed is the encounters, and you've been using the word encounter. It is encounters that, that we make while we're traveling that 
just uh, are not very much like what we ordinarily uh, run into from day to day. So there, are, there have been some very interesting experiences, both good and sometimes not always so great. And we've heard about uh, travel experiences tonight, as a matter of fact. Uh, the story that I'm telling here is about one of those uh, trips and uh, something surprising that, that occurred uh, to me and uh, some lessons that I learned from it <laughs> that, that I've, I've carried with me in my travels ever since. So there it is. Thank you, Bob. Let's uh, take a look at Bob's story now. You know, it just strikes me in this uh, kind of crazy, unpredictable world we're living in, every once in a while you come across somebody special or somebody who's just unusually nice to you for no particular reason. Sometimes it's just a pure stranger. That's happened to me two or three times, and I, I wrote a little bit about it and sent it to Cheryl, and she said, share one of these things. Oh, and In one of these instances, I was coming back from Greece where I had been for some time, and I flew back into Logan, and I, re, uh, I reached Logan late in the evening. It was about uh, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and um, I had wanted to catch the Logan Express out to Framingham, and I was in a hurry to get through uh, Passport. I got through Passport Control, and then I had to go through Customs. Well, on the flight, uh, you know, you get a Customs declaration form, and I checked yes under the question, was I bringing any food into the country? and uh, naively. So I was pulled out of the line just as I thought I was going to leave the uh, terminal and go out and catch my bus. And I was pulled out of the line and told to open my checked luggage and, and turn over my passport and go through all of that. They drug, went through my checked luggage and they said, what food are you talking about? Well, I had three bottles of olives, which, uh, which I like, especially there uh, that I can't find in this country. And I always bring them back from Greece and two bottles of anchovies that somebody said are the best. And the customs guy looked at me and he said, that's it, that's everything? And I said, yeah, that, that's all the food I've got. He said, oh, well, he says, that's processed food. That's no problem. You don't need to worry about that. And so now I'm, I know I'm missing my bus and I'm really very surly at that point. And I was grumbling to myself. I wasn't, I didn't call him any names, but I know I was unpleasant and I was, you know, communicating my uh, my unhappiness. I put all my stuff together, ran out onto the sidewalk to wait for my next bus. And I'm standing there in the cold with a whole lot of people around, muttering and grumbling to myself about these petty officials and their stupid world rules. All of a sudden I heard a voice and it said, Mr. Foster, Mr. Foster. And I turned around and it was the uh, customs agent. <laughs> And he was running toward me and he had something in his hand he was holding out and he got up to me he said here he said you left your passport behind well <laughs> i felt about that high as you can imagine he turned around he was gone before i could apologize or say anything else but it just struck me that you know every once in a while you come across somebody who you didn't expect to be uh like that and he went out of his way for me and i don't know why he had to find me of all the people waiting for buses. And uh, I, well, I learned then that when you travel, it's good to be pleasant to people, no matter how officious they are, agents and uh, customs people and passport people, be pleasant. And it, it helps a lot, believe me. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And we have cheering going on again um, and a really important message that you remind us with this story to be pleasant in airports and how about in life too. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Of course. And now I'd like to introduce Cynthia Franza, who comes from Hopkinton, uh, is a resident, moved here from Brazil eight years ago. Yes. Yes. Hi, Sinja. <laughs> and Sinja is an author, poet, uh, visual artist who has worked in marketing. And uh, you might see her on the roads running, uh, practicing for half marathons or other races and or getting people to submit and write anthologies, as I know, <laughs> uh, and getting people to smile and hand out flowers to strangers are some of the things about you. And uh, so it's good to have you here, Sincha. 
and wonder if you uh, would like to just say a few words to the audience uh, about your story you're here to share in advance. Thank you, Cheryl, for having me today, tonight. Uh, yes, I have something to talk about my story. When I moved here from Brazil to Hopkinton in, in January 2013, I was here. And a few months living here, I have an experience with uh, a neighbor here. And it was a very graceful experience. And I found here in Hopkinton a very welcome community. And I'm very grateful for that. And, and I keep saving uh, meaningful things people uh, give me from the past, from the time that I moved here. Like this card that I, I just keep with myself is a present from a neighbor. And it's about that, the story. So you are listening to now, the story about this gift and how people here are gifts for me. Thank you. You can listen to the story. Oh, and are your parents watching? Yeah, from they're watching Brazil. Brazil. So hello, Brazil. Yes. Also. My parents are watching. All right. Well, Let's see Cynthia's story from here to Brazil. <laughs> Welcome cough in my neighborhood. Today I'm talking about the story that happens in March 2013, uh, just a few months after I moved from Brazil to United States here in my neighborhood in Hopkinton. Uh, in February, my, my, my neighbor crossed the street called Heather she came to our home to give us a welcome uh, gift back with like cards, pumpkin bread, a candle. And uh, it was very nice of her. And she, she came to, when she came and rang the doorbell, I was so excited to see uh, some soul. What, uh, what, it was winter 2013, it was very cold for us Brazilians. That's why I'm wearing this hat tonight. Um, and uh, I was so excited to see a soul <laughs> that I gave her a huge Brazilian hug. I think she was, she was like that. I think she didn't expect it. And I forgot that I was learning about the culture, American culture, Massachusetts culture. I was learning, reading about it. And I saw you cannot like give you hugs like in Brazil. Like you give a lot of hugs there. You can shock people. People have a different culture. Just respect that. Uh, before your friends, of course, after your friends, and uh, know the first encounter, but after your friends, you are more na it's more natural, give you hugs or kisses. Uh, and But the first encounter could be a little shock for my neighbor across the street. But she's not traumatized, she's okay. Uh, sorry, Heather. <laughs> uh, after that, she invited me for a brunch, a welcome coffee with the ladies in my neighborhood. It was my first time uh, doing that here. Um, and I, I, I have to tell, I was a little nervous. Actually, I was very nervous because I didn't speak English properly. At the time, it was just moving in. I didn't speak English, English when I moved here. And um, I, ha I have to meet people. And I know I'm Brazilian. They knew it. I'm Brazilian. And I was, you know, when you're nervous, you don't know which kind of clothes you have to wear, uh, what, what image, what perception, what label they have about Brazilians. Um, you know, it's all the insecurity. I think they are natural when you're in another place and you don't you don't know well the culture, you don't know very well the language, you don't know how the people you react to your way to be. And I, I remember I have the picture that I can share here with, with this video. I have the picture of the clothes that I was wearing because I was not sure which kind of clothes I have to wear. And I took a picture sent to my family in Brazil. They said, Cynthia, just be yourself. And you'll be okay. But are you sure? Be myself. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so happy. People will be like shocked. And they said, no, that's okay. Be yourself. You'll be, be okay. If you don't speak English, they can help you. And then I came for the, the breakfast, the brunch with the ladies. I came with some treats from Brazil. Pão de queijo and brigadeiro I brought to the to the meeting. They brought some special some treats from the United States too. Delicious, by the way. And, uh, and you have a very nice conversation. They are so excited to meet me. I was excited to meet them, nervous, I, 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 I have to tell. I was nervous, but I was excited as well. And you talk about your families, you talk about uh, how they can help me find like services here in town, how they can, um, they can help with sports, school, um, and all the things that us as moms, uh, you are dealing with day by day. So um, you are all the same. Don't judge people. Go When you go to first encounters like that, of course, I, I have to tell, I was nervous, but 
when you go to the first impulse, go with, go with your open heart. Go with open mind to meet different people than you and listen to them. They are different, but actually you're all the same because you have the same wishes as moms, as uh, spouses, uh, wives. You, you like the best future for our children and our families. And you have this common ground. So um, my, my tip or my, my suggestion to you in your first encounters after you go to, through this difference cultural between countries is open your heart. Be yourself, respecting the others, and you will learn with each other. That uh, is a real journey of life. You learn a lot with each other if you don't put labels before meet people. You can be surprised, you can surprise yourself uh, in this journey of self-discovery and discover the others. You're all the same with our wishes, with our hearts, and with our dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sincha. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yourself, speak from your heart, open your heart. Uh, those yeah. message we can take from you and your experience, from your story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and so uh, we are, uh, we have one story left to close with. And that is with Mike Tarosian, who works at HCAM TV, who's not with us, so he can't uh, talk to us about his story. But I will just say thank you all uh, here who uh, have come to share stories for the first time on Zoom. This is a very different experience, but really wonderful to be together and hear all kinds of stories. Just like we said, there are a thousand different ways to share them of different topics in life. And we have certainly traveled a, an interesting journey with all of your stories of experience and places and interesting strangers uh, that you have met. Our next program will be in a month and addressing the theme of All You Need Is Love uh, from that uh, Beatles song. Um, uh, and stay tuned for information on HCAM TV. We're closing with Mike and we're just going to end as Mike fades away from his story. Mike has worked at HCAM TV and in production uh, as a producer, host and editor. He loves his work, I wrote in introducing him. He's uh, busy covering the basketball game right now, and I know I've worked closely with him on a number of programs through the years. And I looked at his story he submitted for this theme, and I wasn't sure what he was addressing at first for his story. And he's talking about this time of dealing with the pandemic. And then I realized that the pandemic is his stranger for his story. And he, he offers some advice for us all in thinking about self-care at this time. So I thought that would be a good way for us to end and to consider the stories that have been shared tonight, consider the stories you have to share. And I look forward to seeing you the next time we are here for Common Ground Storytelling. Thank you so much, all the participants. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, uh, everyone out there watching and uh, here we go. Let's go see what Mike has to say for his story, sending us out. Well, here we are telling our little stories tonight. And, you know, I'd just like to basically talk about how has COVID changed my life? <laughs> well, you know, it's changed my life. It's changed your life. Nobody cares how it changed my life. I'm a person that believes in face-to-face -face communications. This communications is very, very tough for me. And when Cheryl asked me to come on and tell my story and tell a story, and doing it this way was tough. I, I'd rather be in the studio with all of you in the audience and us exchanging stories. That's how I'd rather do it. But here we're doing it like this. And, it, it, and it's tough for me. It's very tough. It's, it's hard not to have that personal connection uh talking in front of a camera sure you know a great boss that trained me how to do it and and um and, and showed me how to get all you in front of the cameras as well so yeah that that can be done but it's just not the same 
you know, and when I took this career on 13 years ago, it wasn't because I was skilled television producer, camera operator, editor, director. No, no, that was all trade. I was hired for my people skills. <laughs> and this whole new career for me, which started as a hobby, has been fantastic up until now. And the reason it's been fantastic up till now is because COVID is keeping me away from what I want to do most. And that's working with volunteers, working with uh, five people that are on this program, being in the studio with them, or being out at, a, at another location. And it is, it's, it's been very difficult. It's been hard to overcome. And one way that we overcome it is by doing this more often, talking into a camera, talking to your friends over your phone, FaceTime, Zoom, whatever media you choose. And you do that more often, that's you know becoming the new norm, but it's still not, not good. When we got the news that the studio was going to close and it had to work from home, I thought, yeah, okay, a lot of people do it. Let's see how that goes. And it, it, it's just awful, missing that personal connection. My passion in this whole job is connecting community. And now I'm connecting it without being out in it, being out with you, being out uh, with the events that were going on. And now we're doing everything more virtual. And so it's it's been a whole new adjustment. But um, I tell you, it it wasn't easy and, you know, everyone has their stories and no one's, you know, worse than another or better than another. Everyone's got a story. And, you know, it was, it was tough trying to get started working out of the house, turning my dining room into a, a virtual TV studio. And with that challenge, um, the only way that I could get through it is, is by having, support in a in a great team and it's 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 all teamwork here at HKM and and there is no I you know every, every say oh yeah we got to do this we got to do that and well yeah I'm talking about myself I got to do it but I I never say I it's always we and to have uh great support from a fantastic boss a great station manager and um and a friend who basically saw that I was struggling and knew that this is not me. This is not how to be. I should be out and about. But knowing that he was able to make suggestions, make corrections, and, and to help me, uh, to you know, to get through and, and to rebuild. And I think that Everyone just needs to find that kind of support, whether it's at home, whether it's from your work colleagues or friends. You, there's, you got to find that support. You don't try to take this on yourself. Don't try to uh, get yourself hunkered into a corner that you can't crawl out of. Use the support. Even if you're used to give it all the help, it's great to get it. And that's the only reason why I can survive this pandemic the way that I do. And, and I'm happy for that. So just put on that big smile. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And keep on enjoying life. It, it will get better. I'm thankful for what I have. And thank you, Cheryl, for this opportunity.